Hello everyone and welcome to this week's webinar uh, where today we're going to be talking about all about affordable housing and how we can really maximize that. I know I get a lot of questions from people saying, you know, we want to keep under that affordable housing threshold. We don't want the complexities of bringing in another partner and what does the affordable housing provider want? How is all that going to work? And think it's a bit of a headache, but personally, I think what it means is you're just restricting yourself to dealing with smaller schemes. And there's a huge wealth of opportunity to opening up some of these larger schemes and bringing in an affordable housing provider, which isn't as scary as it sounds. And luckily, we have um, a bit of an expert with us today, uh, Mr. Andy Rhodes, who I think you've just turn on your screen there as well. I think uh, I think you're on mute as well. But um, hi, Andy, how you doing? Hi, Andrew. Yeah, very well, thank you. Are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. Very good. Um, so just to get on before we begin and find out a bit more about Andy and and um, all the expertise that he's got, um, we will record this session for everyone. Um, you will get a link sent to you at the end of it. Um, submit your questions at any time. Um, yes, I'm wearing a Christmas jumper. I mean, if I did have a Christmas hat, we probably could have gone a bit more Christmassy, but I don't. Want, uh, but do ask any any maybe property related questions at the end. Um, and there's a lot of stuff as well, just to sort of feedback and make sure that we're we're tailoring these sessions so that you're getting um, all the information that you want. Um, so yes, today um, I am Andrew Green, the Customer Success Director here at Nimbus Maps. And my background was pretty much 10 years at Taylor um, dealing with um, various skills of residential development. And I've dealt with many Section 106s and many, and pretty much, well, every scheme I dealt with had affordable housing on it. So I'd like to think I can give my two pennies worth. But then we have um, Andy, who is uh, the founder of Foster Green and Brown, which is all about helping people with um, affordable housing and section 106s and everything. I don't know you want to give us a bit more of a background, um, Andy. Yeah, I can. I can do. Um, I've spent 20 years working within the affordable housing sector, um, working for a number of different housing associations. Uh, more recently, um, set up a, a planning consultancy or land and, land and development consultancy with a, a strong specialism in affordable housing. Um, Help, help a number of the national house builders place their their section 106 affordable housing as well as um some of the smaller guys and regional um yeah, yeah. Consult, consultancy agreement with with avis and young providing affordable housing um advice to their clients as well fantastic and um and to be honest yeah i think like i said it's it's such a key part of development once you get you know like you say above that affordable housing threshold you know that there's you know and i know it's a bit of extra complexity <laughs> but hopefully today we're going to have a bit of a run through i think i've got the agenda here um in terms of you know state of play of the market sourcing um housing providers you know because ultimately all this is is a case of just getting someone to to take those units um obviously we'll talk through that process the pitfalls um how we go about contacting them managing you know some little tips around managing on site as well and then i think we've got a little bit of a case study have me Andy, to, to run through and, and bring that to life a little bit um which then i suppose leads me to leads me to to you andy and um potentially uh sharing your screen shall i um see if we can do that uh i think if i make you horse you should be able to share your screen now Yes, I can. Uh, what do we want? We want. Right then. On that one. Bear with me. Just make sure I'm in the right place. Yeah. So, uh, Andrew, you've obviously already done the um, the sort of the introduction to to who we are. Um, it's on the slides for anyone who wants a, wants a bit more information. Um, but uh, the, the slides I'm going to work through today are, are very much a sort of a step by step guide to um, identifying and tendering the Section 106 element of the sites. It's really targeted at, at people who have perhaps been nervous around working on sites that have um, 
affordable housing delivered on site. You know, I'm mindful that there's a lot of developers out there that deliberately try and skirt under the affordable housing threshold, partly through through nervousness of working with um, with, with registered providers, housing associations, um, through the complexity, partly through for other reasons around financial viability but um it, it's really it's really targeted at making sure that people have got a decent understanding of the process and can go away and um give some consideration to whether they're going to be brave enough to uh, to take the leap and uh, start delivering some schemes with with the um with the section 106 affordable housing on on site i think the the major benefit obviously obviously of doing that is that it just allows you to move on to to, to bigger and bigger sites it's um in my view, you know, it's a, protect, a real, a real uh, constraint on businesses when they're unable to or unwilling to take on larger sites because of the the element of affordable housing that needs to be provided. So, first and foremost, you know, many of the many of you you view in this will already be familiar with um, with the definition of affordable housing. This is the the government's definition. So, that affordable housing includes social rent, affordable rent, and intermediate housing. Um, typically, that would include the shared ownership provision that many of you might might hear around hear about, um, and it's provided to specified eligible households whose needs are not met by the market. It can be new build or private sector property that has been purchased for the use of an affordable home. What we'll be focusing on today is clearly the the new build property element of it. So if I move on. Go on, just, just, that, Andy, I just thought you know, just so we're all clear on on some of these sort of definitions and everything. So. Um, yeah sort of social rented tend to be that sort of really yeah so it's a, uh, low value isn't it you know so yeah so so social rent is the the very very traditional affordable housing products um you know it's the reason why a lot of people still refer to affordable housing as social housing um social rent is um is is calculated um, and it, this is detail rather than required knowledge, but it's calculated by using a number of multipliers around um, value of the property in 1999, um, the local earnings levels within the local authority area and the number of bedrooms the property has. And it's typically the lowest form of um, the lowest value rent um, that, that could be provided. So for any of you out there that are using any sort of rules of thumb as a percentage of open market value to calculate your affordable revenue income, this would be the one that would be the the lowest of the of the affordable products typically mm -hmm. affordable rent was was introduced probably 15 years ago now and this was um designed to, to really it was designed to try and reduce the the level of grant funding required um to deliver new affordable housing on grant funded schemes it's a rent level that's uh, typically set at 80 percent of uh, of the market rent locally um certified by an RICS valuation so the housing association would would pay an RICS valuer to tell them what the affordable rent locally would be and that's the figure that they would use for their appraisal this is the higher value generating of the two um two rented affordable products and then onto the intermediate this could catch a number of different product types but most typically would be something like discounted market sale um, or shared or most typically shared ownership um, mm -hmm. and obviously shared ownership is very much what, what it sounds like it's where the housing association will retain some ownership of the property and the the purchaser um, will will buy an element of the property and they'll pay some rent on the retained equity so the housing association's retained equity that is um they like um, rent back a small bit, don't they? So that yeah, you know, yeah. Them, so they, if, they if a buyer that. purchases fifty percent of the property on day one, um, typically less than that. But if it was fifty percent, then they would probably pay two point seven five percent of the unsold equity. So the the value of the second fifty percent of the pro of the property on an annual basis. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's a rent, the rent figure is is lower than um. Then a mortgage payment is likely to be on the on the outstanding fifty percent, but it's um, it's still relatively significant actually. But it, uh, like you say, that's probably the generates the highest value out of all of those those three. Then typically, correct, it? correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just a quick question: We had are social rent levels the same as the LHA rate? Uh, so absolutely not. No. So the local housing allowance is. Um, 
is a is a figure that's provided at generally on a on an annual basis um, across um, more local housing allowance areas. So each local authority may have one or more local housing allowance areas. Um, that would be a figure that's deemed to be the maximum that the local authority will support from a benefits perspective. So that it's it would be my expectation that a social rent level would be quite significantly below the local housing allowance. Okay. Fantastic. Some housing associations choose to cap their rents at local housing allowance levels, um, and that can be a barrier to to, to securing high re high revenue from the Section 106 element. And I would say actually most cap at local housing allowance, but that said, they don't have to. Mm. Okay. So I'll move on. To the yeah, next yeah. Slide, fantastic. if that's okay. Uh, yeah, so the next the next slide was really just to find the sort of problem we, we're here to here to discuss today because um, affordable housing delivery um, can fall into the two very discrete categories. Um, I've just touched on the reason why um, affordable rent was was generally introduced sort of fifteen years or so ago, and that was around minimising the grant requirements on um, on one hundred percent affordable schemes. So obviously what a lot of housing associations do, and this can be with, with partner contractors, is bring forward grant funded 100% affordable housing developments. So they may, may buy a site and deliver 40 rented homes in a particular location with no open market. Um, you know, that's very much in, in the control of the contractors and housing associations involved with, with that particular uh, sector, which generally gets uh, described as partnerships or, or package deals. Um, but the Section 106 affordable housing is um, is very different. There's no no grant goes into delivering um, the Section 106 element, it, and it's uh, affordable housing essentially that's secured through through planning obligations, through a Section 106 agreement, or um, unilateral undertaking, and it's part of a series of potential planning obligations, which I'm sure people again will be familiar with but could, could involve payments towards um, required infrastructure, open space, education, but almost certainly there will be within a local authority, a planning obligation to secure um, a, a percentage of the open market, of an open market development for affordable housing. The amount can vary. Um, you know, some local authorities are, are, can be as low as 10% affordable housing on an open market scheme. Others can be as high as 50%. So it's obviously, something that needs to be proven through the local plan in terms of viability and need, but um, there's, uh, yeah, there, there can be significant variation. Um, the properties that are secured through, through the Section 106 agreement, or obviously typically affordable housing and um, fall into one of the categories we, we discussed on the earlier slide, so probably social rent, affordable rent or intermediate. Um, and then the expectation generally within with the local authorities is that those, those properties are transferred onto a registered provider. Um, and that is typically a significant discount from the properties unencumbered open market values. And again, there's there's different rules of thumb that, that people will be using within their appraisals. They vary geographically, um, but, but, you know, for for, a, for an estimate. Um, sort of a national rule of thumb, which you should never use, but you're probably around 45% 40, of open market value in a typical uh, location for social rent, 55% of open market value-ish for affordable rents, and somewhere between 65 and 75% and uh, 70 of open market value for, for any shared ownership properties. Um, what I tended to use in terms of those percentages that you're talking about, the you're right i think them they might be slightly lower than maybe what i was used to but i guess depending on the, the sort of values of the area that you operate in but typically you'd you know like in, in the appraisal you know if you looked at the revenue um for your affordable housing element compared to your private element you know typically it's at, at, at a level which is around that sort of 55 to 60 percent i think you know, yeah what, as a as a blended figure i think that's again yeah. a fairly fairly typical rule of thumb mm. so i think you know if if you're Speaking to a you know an affordable housing provider and and you're getting their their quote back for the for obviously those buildings that you're building you know obviously you're you're handing over stock but you know if they're saying look for that three bed we're only going to give you X and that's well below sort of fifty percent then then I think then you know on a blended average obviously um, across depending on the, the type of affordable housing 
then I think then there's, there's probably question marks around, you know, whether whether you're getting the best value there and, and whether it's worth speaking to more people, isn't it? So quite um yeah, I I tend to tend to agree with you, Andrew. The figures I quoted there for, for the part of the world that I would typically operate in, so northwest, east east mids, west mids and um and southwest, I would probably be expecting slightly above those figures. Um but I've done some some work across Yorkshire more recently where the figures were were actually fairly significantly below the figures I've just quoted for for a variety of different reasons. So it's um it, it does have some fairly significant geographic um variations actually. Yeah. So obviously how how to establish what the affordable housing requirement on a particular site is can, can vary as well. So it depends really what the, the status of the particular site that that the, the um, that people are looking at is if it's a site that's already secured an outline or a full full planning consent, then it's fairly straightforward. You should be just reviewing the the, the section 106 that's attached to either that outline or or, or full planning consent. And within that uh, and within that section 106 agreement, there'll be some information that will be relevant within the definitions at the front of the document. But towards the rear of the document, you'll have an affordable housing schedule. And that will be providing all of the information that you need, which will include some information on the number of properties and, and the tenure. If um, if the site doesn't have um, any planning history, then unfortunately you've uh, you've then got to go away and try and review the local authorities' planning policy documents to see what the the requirement is. Um, if I can work out how to use the computer properly, I'll try and just demonstrate why this can be a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare for people um i hope i should be on here somewhere so yeah this is uh this is a an example from a, a site in dudley so this would be their um supplementary planning document relating to planning obligations june 2016 a relatively recent document so scroll through to the affordable housing section and you know this is this isn't um this isn't unusual this is actually very typical there's a fairly uh, definitive um, policy position here, a black country core strategy of which Dudley uh, forms part, uh, requires the delivery of 25% affordable housing on all sites of 15 dwellings or more. So good news is we know actually now that there's a 25% affordable housing requirement on sites within Dudley. And we know that if we're 15 dwellings or more, we're gonna have to deliver those homes. The the slight, the slight difficulty in authorities such as Dudley's, uh, particularly at appraisal stage, um, and as, as I say, this is more common than, than perhaps people expect, is that when you start to think about what the tenure of those properties might be, so that would be how many of them are affordable rent, how many of them are social rent, how many of them might be intermediate, you, you may end up coming towards something like this where it says the required tenure mix will be negotiated on a site by site basis based on local need. So that might be the time that you would um, try and speak with the local authority directly and see what they've, um, what their preference is for the sites, the site you're specifically looking at. The other alternative might be to review some other planning applications locally, um, where there probably will be section 106 agreements uploaded onto the planning portal. Um, and you can have a, a route through and see what other developers have managed to negotiate in terms of the tenure split. Um, I guess the, th the third place is you you could phone up and you know someone such as myself who's involved in affordable housing day in day out and has probably uh, had relatively recent experience negotiating section 106 agreements with the local authorities in question and we'll be able to provide that information um, relatively quickly or, or probably immediately in truth. Um, but it's not always helpful when you're trying to appraise a scheme and there's there's a degree of ambiguity around the, the policy, particularly when we've, we've talked just around some of those rules of thumb, so that we, we may be trying to push for a higher percentage of shared ownership to maximise the revenue on the affordable element, but it may not actually be achievable based on the local authority's position. So ho hopefully that's, that's useful. The, the other, um, at, at this point, I may also use the um, use Nimbus to just have a, a look at the. It's going to take me straight to the title. Hopefully, yes, it does. So to look at the look at the planning history. So if I was trying to find the, the section 106 itself, I may follow through the application here. Um, I think it's 
not that one. So um, there's, a, there's a number of condition discharges on this particular site, which are making it a bit more difficult to pick it up because the developer in question's on site. Um, I saved the link earlier just so I didn't get caught caught out on the, the webinar. And, yeah. and you know you can have a look on here. Unfortunately, on, on this in this particular instance, the local authority hasn't uploaded the completed section 106 agreement to the portal, so we'd be um, we wouldn't be able to establish just from a review of the information on the planning portal what the affordable housing requirement was. Um, this is actually a site I, I was involved with, so I, I do know um, where it where it ended up. Uh, wrong one. Let's get rid of that. I want that one. No, I don't want that one. So trying to get back to the webinar. Where is it? Juggling lots of things. Yeah, I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> hey, can I shift that? Yeah. Probably shut it down by the looks of the blow. Yeah, must have done. Give me a second. That's all right. The um, I'd say yeah. That you know, while you're trying to find that link again, the I'll explain <laughs> the the, the one oh, six. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one oh six agreement, like you say, is is set out right at the you know when you're getting planning permission. You know, uh, you know, a lot of the times you'll get your your outline planning permission subject to signing a section 106 agreement and as part of that section 106 agreement which is all the, the planning gain all the contributions to schools and all of that kind of stuff right. which will be within there will then set out what that affordable housing is and that's your point at which you then negotiate the affordable housing however if you're buying a site with an outline or a detailed planning permission it will be there you know if there's an agent involved or even if you direct with a landowner they will have a copy of it so you know i wouldn't worry too much if it's absolutely absolutely right yeah if you if you're bidding on a site the the agent involved or or landowner um is likely to have a, a copy and will be you know will be providing it with you as part of their you know the, the data pack um because they'll clearly want to make sure you you appraising the scheme on the right 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 affordable housing basis so we, we knew from the policy information that it was a 25% affordable requirement and we knew that actually the tenure mix needed to be negotiated on a site by site basis based on local need. The actual section 106 agreement for that site, which is in, in Dudley, which is why I've been using Dudley as the example, is um, was 13 plots, which was 25%, 13 of, of uh, 52 plots were to be uh, affordable housing. and with a split of seven for affordable rent and six for shared ownership was actually which was actually you know quite a good result something moving towards a 50 50 split between rent and intermediate is is generally a you know a good position for a developer to be in sorry um, andy are you um have i forgotten to stop share the screen have i andrew are you sharing the right screen it's we're just looking at the um at the dudley planning portal here at the moment okay yeah no i'm clearly not I was, um, obviously not. If it helps, I've just sent a, a link. Um... Uh, no, I've definitely got it. Uh, I know exactly where it is. I'd opened it up on a different browser than Andrew, which is a bit, of, bit unfortunate. Uh, That's all right. well, um... I thought it would help, but uh, it didn't. There we go. There we are. Be back. Yeah. So this. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Um, apologies. Yeah. This is the information that um, that was actually within the section one hundred six agreement. So seven affordable rented plots and, and six shared ownership. As I say, that's uh, generally a, a pretty good result. Um, anything moving towards a 50 50 split be, um, between um, rent and intermediate i would would always say is, is a good a good position to be in um generally that the larger the amount of rent and in particular social rent the lower the the blended offer will be from the housing association on a percentage of open market value so is that is that helpful andrew 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say that, you know, ultimately if you're there negotiating that section 106 with the with the local authority and, you know, obviously your, your planning consultant or maybe a dedicated housing association consultant like, like Andy here um, can obviously help you with that. But, you know, like you say, that real basic, you know, how do we, how do we maximize the value of, of the, of the affordable housing element, dry, trying to drive as much, um, of the shared ownership, which is the highest value of all the different forms, is obviously a win for the developer because that's going to then drive a higher value from the housing association and the less social rent. Now, obviously, you've got to provide, you know, what the, what the local authority will ultimately agree to in the end, but that's where you want to be pushing your argument just to be driving as much for um, shared ownership. Um, and that will get you the highest offer from the local authority, from the housing associations. And the higher their offer, the more likely you are to make a, a margin on on obviously those um, on on that element as well. So, uh, sort of move, moving on to how do you find the housing associations so that you can get their offers for your section one hundred and six element? Um, I think what what you'll find is as you do more and more sites, particularly if you work tend to work within a you know a, a fairly consistent geography, is you'll start to learn the the individuals involved and the organisations involved. With the delivery of affordable housing locally uh, local to you um, but generally the easiest place to start for for most developers when they're looking to take the first step into affordable house schemes with an element of affordable housing is to go onto the local authorities website and just type in in this instance again using dudley as the example dudley housing associations and it'll eventually you'll find the link to a page such as this one um, then you see that there's a housing association section here. We're renting from a housing association, and this is the one we're after, the housing association contact details. So what, you, what you'll generally know is if you've obtained the housing associations operating within the area from the local authority, they're probably partners that the local authority are, are happy with you working with. Um, there are some for-profit housing associations that, um, that, that are, definitely worth speaking to um but ne don't always come with the local authority's seal of approval which can bring uh, added complication and if we're working on sites at the at the smaller end of the spectrum the complication is probably a complication i suggest you could you could do without um so you'd, you'd hear you'd get a number of different organizations contact details often it may just be a list of housing associations operating within the area you might have to do a bit of a uh, bit of investigative work on Google yourself or LinkedIn or similar to find the the right people to speak to, or try and go through the you know the general contact uh, emails. But that's not necessarily uh, a disaster. The, the main thing is, you know, housing associations um, they've got their own five year supplies, you know, in terms of um, delivery as well that they want to be delivering X amount. Right. Of of affordable housing so they they do want to be contacted you know if you've got a site with a with a potential um requirement for affordable housing then you know their land team their property team absolutely want to be speaking to to you to sort of see whether that's a potential opportunity for them to add add those additional homes into their supply as well so um like you say it's not i wouldn't worry too much if it's just a generic reception number you know if you say look i've got that's a, right with an affordable housing you know that that land and property team will obviously want to speak to you you know accordingly they, they should do the, the other um the other way you can start to investigate who to speak to is, is to use um to use you know the some of the tools on nimbus and um so what one one way i would use nimbus fairly regularly would be to to start zooming in on the location um and seeing if i could see anywhere where there was clusters of properties all sitting within the same title um i think that this one i did i did test and there wasn't <laughs> there wasn't actually a, a huge volume of properties also oh, we may have one here um yeah so the, the council look like they're the predominant landlord in this part of the this part of stourbridge within dudley um what what this may mean is you you want to contact the local authority themselves to see if they've got an appetite for taking on uh, additional council housing through section 106 agreements some have some haven't i know from experience that dudley don't necessarily look to acquire section 106 properties although they have got an active 
new build development grant funded development program of their own so that would be some something that you could use nimbus for and generally use it pretty regularly for that particular function um the, the third way you can find out who to speak to would clearly be to to speak to a consultant such as myself you know i've got a, a geography that i've got expertise within there will be other consultants operating across the country that have got their own little little geographies that they tend to to know the right the right people to speak to within um and yeah just provide a bit of you know i guess sort of color on that as well you know even um you know when i was sitting um in taylor Wimpy, uh we we used a, a specific affordable housing consultant you know to assist us with uh, with the affordable housing on on sites as well so this isn't just something like you know you know oh it's a um it's a nice to have you know even with the resources um we had within a big plc you know we always like to say look to use those experts because you know someone like um andy here will we'll just have that relationship with the rps or uh, with the um the housing associations and with then the local authorities as well you know because they you know the local authority is 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 balancing their needs across that you know so they'll be always thinking well we've got that scheme coming forward they're going to deliver that you know and so you know the more you have an understanding of that the more you can then help to hopefully steer that negotiation to your favor as well yeah that that's absolutely right and and, and particularly um for for developers who are working across multiple local authority areas, which is, is fairly, fairly typical. It's very hard to keep on top of the development aspirations of, the, of, of all of the associations within those areas to know who's, who's doing what and where and when, and to speak to the right people at the right time, but also to understand how they're likely to, um, to pr progress the transaction. You know, so it's, whilst you may have fantastic, a fantastic bid from a particular housing, housing association, um, the consultants may be able to to advise you around their historic ability to proceed with the proceed with the purchase of the properties, whether they're likely to, what's the chances of them not getting board approval, what's the likely time scale for securing the necessary approvals to enter into contract with with the developer. You know, there's whilst clearly the the headline figure is important for the, the you know the the income. From the affordable element of the site there are other considerations that are worth that, that are worth bearing in mind that you may that may not ob immediately become um evident to to people who aren't regularly having conversations and helping to deliver um section 106 affordable housing so the general next step once you've identified the affordable housing requirements so here we know it's 25% affordable housing, and we know that there was seven rented and six shared ownership properties. We've we've been onto the local authority website, we've checked Nimbus, we know who the housing associations operating locally are. My my next suggestion would be that actually you, you run a essentially a, a mini tender process within um with with those associations. I would suggest it's probably no more than half a dozen that you target and you try and target the six that you think are are most likely to be keen to secure those properties. I think it can become obvious when you approach too many parties, and what that does is makes them makes them feel a bit unloved and not put their heart and soul into securing the plots. So if you can keep the the number of people invited to bid on those to to generally half a dozen, I think it, it's helpful. Um, and then what you want to do is you want to get some information out to them. So. I think the key information you should always be providing to them, clearly the tenure mix, but I've seen many, many other people um, not providing the tenure mix to different developers, uh, sorry, to different housing associations when they've been uh, asking for bids. Um, you, you should be providing them with a realistic view of open market values. Um, that will have to be tested by the housing association surveyor. So it's um, one of the reasons I included the word realistic in there is um, what you won't be able to do is is elevate the open market values to secure a higher revenue um they they will get that they will have, have to test that figure it's part of the the audit requirements for, for the organizations and i think if they perceive that um, the figures were elevated in the first instance deliberately to try and pull the figure up they they tend to find a cautious valuer to pull them down more than perhaps they they would if they thought you'd gone with a realistic figure initially 
um, we should be providing a schedule of property sizes in square meters and feet. What we're trying to do here is make it as easy as possible for the people the other end of the end, end of the phone or the email to to run run an appraisal. And the reason it's important to make it easy for them is that they're incredibly busy. That they're, they're getting contacted with many many opportunities on a weekly basis. You know, a, a large housing association operating across a um, say 30, 40 local authorities, which isn't unusual. I've probably seen 20 section 106 um, opportunities a week. Um, what you want to be doing is making yours one of the ones that they're prepared to do the work on because you know they're super busy, they get it, they've got many, many competing pressures. You want to make sure that they're jumping onto yours and you're making it as easy as them, easy for them as possible so they can do it for you as quick as possible. So the property sizes and a, time, a, a realistic um, timetable for the scheme. That's important because the way that the, the rents are calculated on, um, on both affordable rent and social rent may involve some indexation if the um, completions start to carry out over um, financial years. So what we don't want to do is say that it's going to ha happen too quick because you may uh, quicker than you're actually able to deliver because you may lose the opportunity to benefit from a bit of indexation by dropping into the next financial year on the rents. Equally, you don't want to say it's too slow because if you deliver ahead, they'll probably have to re reduce the rents downwards and you'll, you'll end up with a bit of a hole in the appraisal further down the line. But as a bare minimum, that's the information you should be providing and you should be providing it in a format that is as, as user friendly as possible. You could also be asking them to respond to a series of questions, and this is to start to think about deliverability, time scales. Um, clearly, as a, as a developer, you'll be having to try and meet, meet time scales of your own. And what you want to try and establish is A, whether the housing associations that you're talking to are going to be able to keep up with you in terms of, uh, of progress, speed of progress. Um, but B, you, you want to be managing them to make sure that the associations are completing the right tasks at the right time to enable you to exchange with them when you want to exchange. So what we want to be doing as quickly as possible once you've accepted a bid from a housing association is making sure that they've got their, um, their RICS valuation in place. That's the, typically the biggest hurdle to overcome. Quite often the valuation will come in below your assumed, the developer's assumed market values. That will lead to a potential reduction in revenue for the affordable element and you'll end up having a fairly protracted conversation about, you know, you'll have to provide evidence to show why you think your values are right. They'll try and do, do the opposite and, and you may end up meeting in the middle. You may end up proving, proving that your figures were right. But the, the sooner you start that process and understand whether there's a potential issue on the, on the um, RICS valuation, the better um, as soon as you've decided which party you want to run with. Um, you also want to look at the other conditions that are attached to any offers. So some associations will have fairly significant specification documents, particularly on shared ownership properties that you should be considering. So that may, that may involve carpeting of some areas. It certainly would involve vinyl in some areas. They may have enhanced kitchen specifications. Um, it could run into a multitude of different things. So you want to ask them what if they have any specification requirements that they expect the properties to be delivered to. There may be a negotiation further down the line about what that specification really looks like, but in the first instance, you should be trying to understand what it is that they would, would like and taking it from there. Uh, gone are the days, really, to be honest, of you telling a housing so of a developer telling a housing association they get what they're given. That isn't the that isn't the way it works now. Even you know the the large the large PLC house builders, you know, such as Andrew's former employer, um, are, they're probably relatively inflexible. But there are elements where they will be having to provide some of the points that the associations are requesting. Um, the one thing to add on that, I think that, that I tend to find with those specification points is they're they're quite keen. They want that sort of low maintenance right. um, spec. You know, like you've got to think that you know that, that they know it's you know going to be slightly probably abused a bit more than if um, you know obviously the rented ones maybe more than the shared ownership slightly abused more than um, than a sort of typical home and therefore right. it's less around sort of oh we want you know the lovely granite worktop and more just thinking you know what can we just have this basic spec which we know is relatively low maintenance or cheap to replace or whatever. Without a lot of it comes down to availability of replacements, uh, you know, so you'll, you'll generally find that there'll be white, white tiles in the kitchens and bathrooms. And that's because that 
you know they're the most readily accessible um, for for replacement if any get damaged. Same with kitchens; they'll probably insist on one or two particular suppliers, um, and that will be because they've probably got agreements in place around um, sort of replacement uh, kitchen doors, carcasses, and the like. So um, it, you're right, Andrew; it's generally around long-term management, maintenance of properties. Yeah, but I suppose that the good thing is, is you know, if you're building in a relatively high value area, you know, the, the spec and the cost to spec that house is probably going to be slightly less than it would be for your open market stuff. Uh, yeah, that's fair. That's absolutely fair. It's, um, you know, it's not going to be bargain basement, but it is going to be, you know, a lot cheaper, which is then obviously going to help offsetting the lower values that you're getting as well, you know, so, you know, it's not just all... No, that that's right. I guess the only the only point is it it's probably different from the other properties that you're delivering on site. So you just need to be mindful that you know when you when you're actually building um, that there is, there is two specifications for your trades to work to, um, which is is a fairly common thing to to miss actually. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and the, I think probably the the most important question at this stage is is around the time scales and process for board approval. What you're trying to achieve here is um, a commitment to a particular board date. Um, so, you know, if I'm sitting here now in December and there was there was bids due back in, I'd probably be expecting to understand the process. Maybe it's maybe there's two boards that it needs to go through. It could be a development specific forum first, where uh, the housing association need development team signs it off and then sends it up to a sort of a, a main board or an executive board. You know, some of those can meet monthly, some of them can meet weekly. The odd one might might meet quarterly. And what you don't want to be doing is is getting it timed wrong, missing missing the the meeting that it should go to, and then it's there's no room on the agenda at the next one, and it can it can have a a, a significant and unnecessary delay. So we want to get uh, get the um, get the get the scheme agreed and start thinking about the the time scales for for approval and process and then making sure that you know just a, a, a gentle nudge every couple of weeks you know how we're we getting on with the approvals have you got your valuation back yet is the is your report going to board this month you know um it doesn't have to be particularly forceful or aggressive you just need to keep tickling it along and making sure that the right things are happening at the right time again you know i've, I've done this hundreds of times so it's something that has become second nature for me but um but other people you know who haven't necessarily been there before quite often forget that there's a, a process and you know oh we're ready to we're ready to go guys they'll say to the housing association the housing association will respond and say well we've got two boards to get through and it's going to be march 2022 now and all of a sudden there's a massive panic because it need, needed to happen sooner than that so um, yeah, indeed. You know, a lot of a lot of development is is just lining things up to all at the right time. To be honest, and and this is just one of them. Like you say, you want to get you know get it all um, the the agreement with the with the specific development team. You know, at the the local authority, the housing association, so that um, like you said, they can go through their process just like you know, like I've had to go through with a with a um, with a big PLC developers they have processes so when we want to sign off a bid and 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 acquire a site we you know we as a big plc have, have got to go through that process as well and, and going through board pro um board approvals so anyone who's doing that sort of um promoter type element you know where you're you're getting planning on a site um securing all that and then selling on to a developer these are the kind of questions which you're asking of the developer as well so go on thank you very much for your bid What's the process you've got to go through if we were to accept your bid? Because they'll they'll undoubtedly have to go through some sort of board approval process as well. So yeah, that's right. And then I think on to the we're nearly nearly there now, Andrew. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so um, you know, we've we've talked about identifying identifying the partner, running a tender, sort of deciding who we're going to go to, managing them through the through the approvals process. Um. So you know we'd be we'd be thinking about putting together a set of heads of terms in the same way you would on a on a land purchase or land sale, and, and actually in many ways the process of disposing of the section 106 element of a site does does um, does reflect the process of a land sale. You know you're trying to present 
the information in the right way to to maximise the interest of the association in the same way an agent would try and um, promote the, the sort of attractiveness of any particular development site. Uh, make, you're making the decision partly on the financial aspects, but also on the, the conditionality attached, the reputation of the organisation for doing what they say they're going to do, which is obviously very, very similar to a, to a, land, a land sale transaction. Um, so we'd, we'd agree the heads of terms, we get the, the solicitors running, we secure the board approval, and then, and then there's obviously various different um, sort of pay, payment arrangements that can be, that can be in place. You know, there's, there can be a straightforward off-the-shelf purchase, so probably a 10% deposit from the housing association with a balance paid on completion, or which is sometimes preferred because it's it's lower and lower in terms of administration. There's less payments to sign off. There's less potentially less uh, scrutiny on site, but actually you're having to carry the the cost of the construction through to through to the completion of the properties. Probably the more common approach is either sort of a golden brick arrangement or a, or a golden brick with stage payments. Actually, so that's probably a ten percent deposit or something along those lines, which may be held held as stakeholder. A twenty percent payment on golden brick and then stage payments through to the completion of the properties, possibly signed off when um, when construction achieves certain certain milestones, possibly signed off on valuation of work. So there's a number of different ways the the financial um, payments can be made. It will come down to, again to a negotiation, and that would form part of the decision making process again. Um, you, sh you should you should expect that there will be a fair amount of scrutiny on sites. Um, housing associations will probably be have um, either them, themselves through some 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 form of clerk of works, an internal employee, or a contracts manager. They may call them now, uh, or they may have a, an external consultant, which again could be a clerk of works, could be an, an employer's agent. There probably will be. An employer's agent involved somewhere anyway um, to deal with some of the contract administration so there will be a number of people involved and they'll probably want to visit site relatively regularly so some may be weekly some may be fortnightly some may be monthly they probably want some form of on-site project team meeting which i think would generally be, be month, uh, a minuted monthly meeting um, they and they certainly want good visibility on handover dates. It's a, it's a critical item for them. Um, they're un, under significant pressure to achieve completions when they say they're going to achieve completions. And if, well, whilst you guys might be doing all of the work, they will want to make sure that the properties are, are delivered generally um, when when they're expecting them. And that's, that's really around the sort of logistics of moving people in. What they don't want is to have someone ready to move into a property and then the developer to say that particular property isn't ready for a particular reason and then that family has to then stay where they are for another couple of weeks or or, or similar you know it, it can be a, re a real headache so uh, i think accuracy of handover dates is something that you should give some serious consideration to um, and, and the benefit then of working with it, the benefit then is you've, you've built up a, a relationship with a particular association on this site and they may they may like you as well, and you, so you know it's quite easy then to do the work with them on other sites. You've already got the contract documentation agreed between the two organisations, which takes out a lot of the stress. You've got the payment terms probably agreed, and you've started to understand how each other works in terms of supervision on site. So again, you you start to um, to understand the business that, that you're working with, and, um, and and you can make a decision around whether you like <laughs> like how they work or not. But um, more often than not, I think you know, you know, it's a better the devil you know type situation, and um, you do see, tend to see developers doing repeat work with a particular housing association. That's not to say they wouldn't test the price on the next one, running through this a similar tender exercise to the one we've talked about. But but quite often they will go back to the um, developers will go back to the the people they've worked with in the past. Yeah, I think my couple of points just about on here, you know, I think on the on the first one in terms of that, um, the payment terms, this is huge advantage, you know, when you think you're, you know, you're developing out a site and certainly in, in some instances where it's 50%, you know, so I know Oxford is one area where it's, it's yeah. 50%. Um, you know, in those situations, you've got to think if you're getting 10% and you're getting stage payments, 
you're funding you know half the development as you go along you know so that in terms of the um your sort of peak capital funding it's much much lower right. in terms of the requirement than what it would be if you're building all um private housing so even though you're building a much bigger scheme than maybe the level of funding in, in um required isn't quite so you already know from from the outset you know if you're developing 50 houses and for argument's sake, the requirement is 50%, 25% of those are sold, uh, 50% of those are sold, so 25 are gone. You've just got a left with 25 to sell. So that risk profile in terms of thinking, oh, how am I going to sell 50 houses <laughs> is now just I'm selling 25. The other 25, they're paying you at all these stages or as you go along. Um, and, you know, and like you say, they get really particular about the completion date because like I say they've got people lined up for moving or like I say their appraisals assume that you know they'll they'll have you know they'll have got this unit at a certain point and it'll help their grant funding or whatever. And but at the same time you are getting paid at every stage so that you know there's you know ultimately the, the more you're 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 working through the more you're getting all that money back in. Um so that, that's absolutely key for me. I think you know one example which I may, I may show, show later, but um, of a scheme um, we developed um, at TW was a scheme where we actually got 75% affordable housing. So it was a, it was a green, uh, green belt exception site. And as part of being able to get it out of the green belt, we agreed to provide more affordable housing than was necessary. There was a bit of a shortage um, and that got it out. But what it meant was that initial payment that we got from the local, uh, from the housing association was greater than the land value that we paid for the site and therefore you know you think from day one um we've already got more money in the bank than um than if we you know like you said then on a typical site you know so even though we bought the site you know next day we then you know we complete with the housing association we've now got more money in the bank and yet we now own a site uh, a development site and like you say every time we start building all of those um affordable units we're getting all those payments in and then the private houses pretty much paid for themselves by the time we've actually come to sell, sell them on and then that's all profit um so yeah definitely something to think about on that side and then on the on-site side i think like you say yeah the employee's agent you know it's always typical having that sort of monthly meeting with a sort of employee's agent who's just generally sort of more or less just holding you to account that you know they've paid for a whole lot of buildings and then they're you know rather than just trusting so that you know as an individual purchaser you have something like the NHBC who are holding the builders to account that they're building it um, according to the relevant specifications and, and, and building regulations and everything at the time. Whereas for the um, housing association, they've got a bit more invested. So they've, they've got an employer's agent who is, you know, um, one, not only relying on the NHBC, but also for themselves, they want that ultimate confidence that they're getting that you're building it, you know, properly and, and soundly and everything else so that they don't have issues further down the line as well. So, you know, absolutely yeah. right there. You know, their, their appraisal is probably assuming that they're owning the rented property for, for the next 40 years. Uh, I don't think it's unreasonable if you intend to own a particular asset for 40 years to make sure it's being constructed in, in line with your, your own requirements. So, um, but, it you know, it, it is unusual for a developer who's stepping up from over the affordable housing threshold to then have a, someone else's set of eyes um, potentially critiquing the work. So um, I think yeah. it is something to be mindful of. But it, it's when it's, you know, like I say that, you know, I imagine we've got lots of, um, you know, uh, honest and, uh, and well-respected developers on here that, you know, you want to do a good job, you want to deliver a good product and, um, and that's all they're there to do is to just see that you're delivering that good product. So, you know, I wouldn't, fear the situation it's just it's just part and parcel with it that's all i think that's right and i think in in, in summary you know spent a, a fair while talking about the different things but essentially you know that there's nothing to be feared here the complex is, is is generally very very simple andrew it's identify what the requirements the, the site specific requirement for affordable housing under the section 106 agreement is it's identify your partner by probably visiting the local authority website, maybe speaking with a consultant, maybe checking on Nimbus, running a mini, running a essentially a mini a mini tender exercise, moving towards heads of terms, and then making sure it's a you know the approvals goes through without any any hiccups. Um, not none of it's rocket science, and at no, no stage are the housing associations looking to to catch anyone out. You know they're 
as I said earlier, they're massively under pressure to deliver volume. Some of the organisations have probably got development programmes delivering through Section 106 and grant funded programmes, you know, as many as 2,000 new homes a year. You know, they, they delivering 2,000 new homes is, is, a, is a real ask and they, they need to make sure that they're a slick and, and well-oiled machine, but that they also need to make sure that they're not um, slowing anything down. So, you know, they're, they're, there, to, they're there to help where they can. Um, but mm. they, you know, they, there are some quirks of the organisations that, that need to be need to be considered as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Andy. I think, um, you know, like I say, hopefully that gives a real good understanding of just that, you know, that, like I say, getting that first scheme away with affordable housing. And, and for anyone who's maybe done the odd one or two, maybe there's some, some pointers in there as well. It's just a sort of point in the in the right direction with um, with approaching these things, because it is just like another contractor, isn't it? You just, you know, you're just saying, right, OK, let's let's get a contractor to develop out the site. Well, let's get, you know, let's get a contractor to, to do a bulk sale of, of, of all of these plots and and agree in the spec and all of that kind of stuff, you know, ultimately that's all it is. It's just a different value. Um, and for me, like I say, it allows you to do bigger schemes, but de-risk them at the same time, you know, so it's, um, and then those bigger schemes will generate bigger profits and, and hopefully, um, you know, deliver on, on everyone's aspirations in terms of where they want to take their sort of property, um, property development. Um, what I will do, if you don't mind making me host again, Andy, which, um if well, you've, you, seen, you've seen how um my computer <laughs> skills are Andrew, so i'm not entirely i can stop share i can definitely do that and uh well actually hold on i think i can share now actually so maybe that's the uh that's the way to do it um so let me just make sure we are here uh right i think this one uh so um let us get back into it so the next few points i think what we'll do i'll just have a i'll have a brief run through just so that we're all nice and clear how we can sort of um pull out uh, the various bits of information from nimbus um and then we'll get through to to answering people's questions and things like that this was um this was the scheme that i was just having a look at here so this was the um um 51 dwellings that we did um, it was a rural exception site um, in this bit here. I think it, actually the green belt, I think is still showing um, as in the green belt. Yeah, so you can see we managed to get this, this site within the green belt. Um, and I was just going to see if there was a um, <laughs> section or six. Uh, that was the amendment, legal agreements. Um, well, there's the deed of variation. There's the 38 and the 15. I wonder if this is the full agreement. Um, or just the, uh, yeah, I think it's just the variation bits um, to these, unfortunately. But you can see all the definitions of, of what a shared ownership unit is um, and then all the various other bits. I imagine, I have to say, I can't remember as to why we made a deed of variation. Uh, with this one but you can see this one was with um with south oxfordshire um, generally the deed of variations will will re probably relate to the mortgage exclusion clause which is a particular um the particular bugbear of associations and it's it's highly important for them because it affect, affects their ability to to uh, raise capital against the assets so it's um it's boring stuff but actually it's it's a it's a good point that that gets gets raised andrew because it, it highlights why it's useful to have early conversations with housing associations. If there isn't a signed section 106 in place, you may be able to save yourself the pain of the deed of variation by getting some advice from one or two of the, the organisations in advance mm -hmm. and making sure that mortgagee in possession clause or mortgagee exclusion clause is, is as it should be. Yeah, it does look like certainly the chargey element. Yeah. It, it, and a few other Nine, 95 there. times out of 100 the the, per, the the reason for the deed of variation will be the mortgage in possession clause yeah and, and maybe we can we can use this as an example i mean and i normally do open it up so i mean if anyone wants to throw in a, a in a location um i can maybe look there so you don't feel like i'm um cheating by using a 
um, a pre-selected location or anything, but um, let's just say, for argument's sake, I can see there isn't a, necessarily a rush of people uh, putting locations. So we'll use this as an example because we are getting on for time now. Say this has come across or say you found this yourself and, and you're thinking, great, you know, we've agreed um, with the affordable housing um, or the, the affordable housing officer at the council. We're going to provide 75% affordable housing. We're going to provide 25% um, open market housing. How do we go about um, finding out who to work with? There was a few areas that we could help. You know, one of those is saying, well, look, where is the um, affordable housing providers in the area? Obviously, you can search the local authority's website to see whether there's preferred um, partners that they prefer working with. I have to say in Oxfordshire, I don't remember them ever having sort of preferred partners. Um, there was obviously a lot of people who they used, you know, regularly within South Oxfordshire, but it was more about who just operated in that area. Um, and then, like I say, a great way of looking at it is trying to find um, these odd little bits of properties that are owned by, by multiple, uh, multiple properties under a single ownership. And you can see here, Soha Housing. And if, um, if we did this, the search company properties, then we'll see certainly across South Oxfordshire and yeah. slightly um, into, well, you can pretty much tell this was pretty much my whole patch when I worked at Tello MP, uh, was the, you know, pretty much the whole of Oxfordshire there. So we did a lot of work with um, South Oxfordshire Housing Association. But you can see here that one of the key things when, when an affordable housing provider is looking for whether they take a particular site is have they got a lot of stock in the area? The last thing the, the, the housing association wants to do is to go, uh, you know what, great. It sounds like, you know, you've got a great scheme here, but we'd literally only be driving for, to, 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 to deal with that one house. What, what they're more likely to do is to say, well, look, we own lots of property in the area. Therefore, when we're maintaining this and we're servicing that property, we can service lots of property all at the same time, so they're not constantly flying around their, their patch. They, they've probably got a, an employed housing manager who's already responsible for managing the relationship with the customers living in those properties. Mm. What, what, what harm does another 20 do? You know, in terms of management efficiency, it's, it's the obvious thing to do, isn't it? It's to secure additional properties in locations where you already own assets. Absolutely. You know, so like you say, so obviously, you know, if we haven't already done the deal, then we wouldn't see them there, but we'd see they've got a whole lot of properties here. They've got a few others dotted around the village as well. So actually they're absolutely going to be at the top of the list in terms of who we approach. Um, but like you said, that, you know, the local authority probably will highlight a few others. So, I mean, to be honest, yeah, we use Bromford a bit as well and um, a company called BPHA, yeah. um, as well as Sovereign Housing and, you know, some of these other sort of slightly bigger names as well, who would also have lots of properties in and around the area and they'd be happy to bid on the site. But then obviously, in terms of understanding uh, what they're bidding on, then we need to have that, that scheduled accommodation. And if you are looking at a particular scheme, um, <laughs> Uh, here this is all planting let's just go straight to the application plans let's just assume there wasn't a um uh there wasn't a lot of variations and everything but um so the planning layout so this is the lovely um planning layout which is then going to sort of detail out and then there we go thank you focus um, who are the architects on this scheme they'll then split out obviously a lot of the properties here and you can see there's your open market there's the affordable and then there's the shared ownership. So in this instance, um, like I say, we, you know, we're approaching it knowing we've got affordable housing. We work with architects and, and we say, look, these are the kind of properties that we all want. Um, and you can see here, you know, someone of a Telebumpy has actual house types, which are specifically designed for affordable housing, which is what this A -A is here. It's an, it's an affordable housing house type. And then uh, you can obviously pull out this schedule, and this is what this is what you want to be giving to um, the local authority, uh, to the housing associations. Is then uh, obviously what properties, the sizes of them, obviously the numbers. You know, both split down as much as possible. You know, if the, if you've already agreed with the local authority or the section one or six has said, look, you know, the three beds have got to all be shared ownership, but all the two beds have got to be um, rented then you've got to obviously then highlight that as well. And so they're nice and clear as to what they're getting. And to be honest, you know, 
typically I think we would then also send um, drawings of, of the actual the, the, the house types themselves, which are probably in here some somewhere. Yeah, so we'll have all the house types and everything as well. So then um, on this, once it all loads up, you can see obviously that full breakdown of, of what they're going to look like. Obviously, all the outside, all of this kind of stuff is the kind of information we'd be then sending over to um, the affordable housing providers to then uh, provide their, their bids back. Obviously, the one thing as well is they're going to say, oh, yeah, well, we think we know what values are in the area. What are your values? You know, if you've just bought the site, what was, you know, what did you get sign off for? Um, in that instance, then we want to start looking at comparables. Um, but, you know, as a headline figure, you know, what, what is this area coming out at? 374 slash 396. I think it's going to be somewhere in that sort of 380. But then, you know, for detailed figures in terms of saying, well, look, this is what, oops, this is what three beds are. This is what two beds are in the area. Then you want to be doing your detailed comparables, the residential comps, list out obviously the criteria that you, you're like working with. You know, so typically we would bit work it on sort of 18 months to two years of sales. The last couple of years have been a bit all over the place. So maybe you want to keep it a bit tighter. And then we want to toggle those on. And ultimately then it's going to start telling you what those values are and we can see here that um even though it was about around that 380 390 mark um you're getting some properties that are exceeding that quite significantly there's a lot of 400s in and around here as well so maybe it's getting up to close to 400 but obviously we can download all this to an excel file where then you can really start interrogating some of that data around what our property is selling for in and around here. And interestingly, I wonder if this looks like a shared ownership is actually, um, is actually sold here um, in 2020. Uh, it can't find that location probably because it's in New Build Street and it's not picked it up. Um, but yeah, that's quite interesting as to, um, it looks like, yeah, probably one of those probably was a shared ownership and they've managed to staircase out or something. But I think that's, that's probably right. Um, but ultimately, with all of these, like I say, you've got all the details here to see the, the full breakdown, uh, both from a pound per square foot, but also, you know, if you'd rather just see sort of values, you know, and say, well, look, we're getting, you know, 300 grand, we're getting 400 grand for a three or a four bed or whatever, then, um, then you can obviously do that as well. That Excel file will look like this, uh, which has opened up down here um, and so you'll see here is the property um, address the price paid the date at which that sold the square footage which we get from the EPC so then that pound per square foot and, and that's typically you know when we're having discussions with um, HAs you're typically saying yeah it's about 410 you know 420 pound a square foot in and around here there's no point saying, look, it's 300 for a three bed because it depends how big it is, it depends on the spec. It's, you know, so they'll tend to work more as a pound per square foot. Now, with the Nimbus, we're providing that market value. So we're now inflating those values depending on um, whether the market has moved. So obviously, you can throw that into your discussions, but like Andy said, they're going to get it um, verified anyway on their end with their own surveyor, but you could say, well, look, the market's gone up 5%, you know, it's going to go up, you know, some to, to an element, you know, so certainly you can then start saying, look, you know, if they're, if they're throwing this back as a comparable saying, you know, look, oh, we think the values are only down at, you know, 380, you can say, well, look, that's sold in 2020, whereas these more recent ones, you know, are, are a bit higher and more like 420 and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's going to be the breakdown and obviously you've got the links through to, to right move if you want to have a look in say well look they're a decent spec and everything as well um, and that's going to give you all of those residential values to send um, across as well obviously Nimbus can help you with all aspects of that development I know today we're talking about affordable housing um, and how we can provide that but ultimately um, you know whether you're looking for those sites in the first place um, you know, through lots of the, um, the, the filters that we have, or whether it's through the strategies to help you find those sort of um, big back gardens where then we can then obviously squeeze a bit more in, and then we can help you find those as well. But if you are interested in, in a lot of that, um, let me take all that off. Then what I would suggest 
is you have a look at our Elite Plus packages, which are going to help you find commercial conversions, residential land and airspace opportunities, or HMOs, depending on which of those strategies you're interested in. If you are interested in one of those, what I would suggest is um, booking a call with the team, having a demonstration of the platform. Like I say, I've just scratched the surface. Have a demonstration with the team. They'll then give you a trial. You can you can play around with it yourself and then make a decision whether it's right for you. Um, for anyone who does want to book a call, um, I've just posted the link there so anyone can just click on that and, and book a time that's going to suit you. Um, Andy, if people want to sort of get in touch with you or find out a bit more about um, how you can help them and, and that sort of side of things. Yeah, best to get me it on the email. I'll just uh, I'll just put put that yeah. in the chat as well. Fantastic. And like I say, so you know, I know Andy operates in in large parts of the country, but um, you know, but like I say, if you've got any um, affordable housing sort of questions and all that kind of stuff, then I'll yeah, I'm happy happy to happy to for anyone to contact me, even if you know the the, the geographies and the geography I I tend to operate in. I'm I'm sure I'd be able to to assist one way or another. So um, yeah, feel, feel free to, to make contact. Fantastic. So I'm conscious of time and we've got about 15 minutes left here. Let's open it up for questions. I can see we've got a few already um, and we shall um, open that up accordingly. Um, Ian has said, does all affordable housing have to be provided on site or could it be provided at a separate site in another location? Do you want to take that one, Andy? Is that over to, over to me? It, it doesn't have to all be provided on site, but but the local authority will will generally not be particularly keen on the idea. And it's certain to a certain degree, it depends on the scale of the development. But I can think of a number of examples where the affordable housing has been provided in a location remote to the to the main the main open market element of the site, but it's very very unusual and the local authority will suspect that it's being done to try and enhance viability, probably by delivering the affordable housing in a um, in a lower value location to the, the wider site. So they will already automatically be on, on the back foot. You'll be on the back foot because they will be suspecting that um, you're trying to improve viability by delivering affordable housing, as I say, in a, in a location which isn't as desirable as the the main site but that said it's it's not it's not a definite no um I, I can think of a number of examples where people have successfully done that yeah and and to honest, one of the points i wanted to add was um uh another scheme um that i worked on we did a little bit of garden grabbing um here to extend onto this obviously much larger scheme and in this one we did argue um to have a um, a contribution to affordable housing rather than providing on site yeah. It was only a seven unit scheme and we did get into a bit of an argument as to whether it was a seven unit scheme, uh, which was the number of houses on here, yeah. or whether it was part of this wider, much larger, you know, thousands of houses scheme. Um, and in the end, to settle the argument, we, we agreed to make a contribution um, as though that there was a there was a small percentage of this of this scheme that was that was to be affordable housing, but not actually deliver any on, on this element here. So. Um, it, Yes, it can be done, but I think, like you say, probably certainly from my experience, maybe at that smaller end, where then it's it's starting to then become a bit difficult. I know we looked at a scheme within Oxford um, where we were bidding on the site, and and they'd actually agreed um, a contribution instead because it was quite a small site as well. And um, and I think Oxford preferred, I think, to then push their affordable, I think, somewhere else. You know, in that instance, so. Um, so I think it's probably dependent on the on the local authority as well, isn't it? So it is, but I think the, the general position for most local authorities, unless they're asking you to provide the affordable somewhere else, will be that you try and do it to um, to to enhance profitability, and it, that mm. they'll they'll be resistant. Um, but it can yeah. be done. I've seen I have seen it done. Yeah, I was going to say, but that is, you know, that's that's the only scheme that everything I've worked on that we've that we've managed to get that. You know, otherwise it's been deliver on deliver on site. Um, Vic has asked, uh, thanks for sharing. Um, once you have to secure the site, you as a developer need to have full funds for the construction, or is the housing start allowing some funds over the 
building actions? How does the financial side of things go? Thanks again for sharing. Um, I'm, I think I'm trying to sort of pick out in terms of how your funding might work. I think this is just something that you've got to sort of, I think, factor into your own appraisal that, you know, if, if you're doing a deal with a, with a HA and typically they would, or we would try and, and contract with a HA within, ideally within like a week um, of, of, of signing a land contract. So as soon as we're contracted to buy a particular piece of land and we're buying it, ideally we're looking literally to, to I mean, back to back, but you're never going to tie the two contracts together, but, you know, ultimately try and enter into that HA contract almost exactly at the same time. Now for a big PLC, which can fund that difference, I appreciate for a smaller um, house builder, you've got to then manage that, um, you know, that gap between the two. But what it does mean is then just really thinking through that appraisal, working with your funders or working with that, you know, those investors to say, look, you know, I need this much money to, to buy the site. But then from, from day one, I'm getting 10% from the HA, which is going to cover, you know, part of it, or it's going to cover the first element of build. And therefore I need less money as I'm sort of developing out the site. And I think you can just sort of manage that cash flow, um, you know, and that, that, that sort of peak funding you'll need through building the site, because like I say, is, is if you, if you build it sensibly, you'll build, you know, part of the open market, part of the affordable so that you're getting, as you're working down a, you know, a street scene or something, you are getting part of the money, from the HA as you're working down and then also then being able to then sell units you know privately as well to then recoup the money at the end so I think it's probably worth mentioning that most housing associations um so if, if you're considering going starting a development sort of without securing all of your all of your necessary funding they will be running um, a financial check on any partners so you'd need to make sure that you could demonstrate that you've got you know you were sufficiently financially able to uh, to bring that site forward yeah so i think i think but ultimately it's i, I don't know whether that I don't, maybe vic i think this is where you're i think you're trying to get out in terms of that funding if, if you've got a ha providing some funding you know and you don't need as much you know how does that how does that yeah, balance? Yeah. hopefully that um that clarifies you know that um that's what you're after um Ian's asked, how are housing associations funded? Um, I don't know, do you want to handle that one, Andy? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, fairly straightforward, to be honest, Ian. Um, housing associations typically, um, well, the, the not-for-profit housing associations, which are the, the sort of traditional established names that most people would, would be familiar with, will have been, had the benefit of um, huge levels of, of grant subsidy when they were establishing the bulk of their portfolio, probably in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, that grant funding at the time could have ranged between 70 and 100% of the cost of developing those properties. So they've got absolutely huge amounts of um, property with very, very little borrowing sitting against it um, because it was essentially paid for by, by government grants. The level of grant now is um, significantly lower than that, but clearly they've got the benefit of uh, the ability to raise finance against those historic assets. Um, more recently, there's been a, an introduction of for-profit housing associations, so legal in general would, uh, would be a good example, as would SAGE. They would be funded by large institutional funds who see the affordable housing sector as a safe place to secure a relatively reasonable long-term return. Fantastic. Obviously, obviously the, the benefit that the associations also have is they have a, the ongoing rent roll from the properties they own. They may do an element of sale themselves as well. So the sort of the operating margin on an annual basis will come through through rent. Um, but yeah, the, the real benefit they, they've had is the, 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 the legacy grant, which has given them huge amounts of property to borrow against. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I think we seem to have answered all of the questions, which, um, which is great if we seem to have answered everything. Hopefully that was all um, very useful. And like you say, we have a few minutes left if anyone wants any sort of last I minute. spotted one about shared ownership staircase in Andrew. I don't know if you'd pick that one up i think that was luke um and he was asking what it means to staircase out 
And yeah, yeah, go for that. Uh, yeah, if you want to just provide a bit more information on that, I, I sort of missed that. Yeah, uh, no, that's fine. Um, what? Well, yeah, I couldn't see see the one you were re- referencing earlier. I don't know where it's gone, but uh, yeah. Any, anyway, Luke, it's um, pre- as long as the property is not in a what's called a designated protected area, so it tends to be a rural area. Um, this any shared ownership properties that sit out sit within a, a generally urban location will have um, won't won't be restricted won't be restricted in terms of the level that a prop, a um, shared ownership purchaser can staircase to. And what that means is if that shared owner wants to move house, they don't necessarily have to sell that prop. That, no, first and foremost, that shared owner can buy more and more of the property as their circumstances change and may eventually um, be in a situation where they're able to buy the full 100% of the property which would be the equivalent of staircasing out. They, they, own, they own the property in full in the same way that, you know, a general homeowner, a purchase of a retailer Wimpy home would own their property in full. The, um, but, but more often than not, the, the, the reason that you see staircasing out, particularly in the instance uh, Andrew highlighted on that site in Aylesbury, I think it was, wasn't it? Which looked like it was a fairly recent, um, mm. it, the, the occupier wasn't in there a particularly long time before a staircasing is, if the shared owner um, sells the property, they don't necessarily have to sell it on a shared ownership basis. They can sell it on a on an open market basis and, and simultaneously staircase to 100% on property sale, um, which is actually a positive for the housing associations because it means that they see the 100% uh, income from the shared ownership property earlier than, than they maybe uh, were anticipating. But local authorities don't like it because they lose the shared ownership plot from the affordable housing portfolio within the local authority area, which is why you'll find some local authorities do try to restrict staircasing. Yeah, but ultimately, yeah, the the, the term yeah staircasing is that is is that sort of because it typically is sort of going from you own fifty percent of the property to fifty five, sixty, Correct. you know, and you just keep buying a bit more of that property and 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 then eventually staircasing um out of the um you know and then ho- wholly owning the property so um fantastic well i think hopefully that's covered everything off then which just leaves us to say well thank you very much andy for your um fantastic content today i think that was um hopefully really insightful for everyone thanks andrew no problem and then thanks to everyone else for joining us today um i'd love to wish you all a, a very happy and, and merry christmas um especially with the backdrop of omicron and all of that uh, hope it is a safe um, and Merry Christmas for everyone um, and obviously to you to Andy as well and, uh, and we'll be back in the new year with hopefully um, lots more exciting webinars for everyone and, um, and really hoping for a nice prosperous um, 2022 for everyone so thank you all for joining and we'll see you all next year bye bye now thanks Andrew